Hey friends, I have something special for you this week. I recently interviewed on the Keep Them Healthy show with Jamie DeLuca. We talked all about my book, You, Me, and Anxiety, Take Action Over Anxiety to Enjoy Being You. We talked about navigating anxiety as a mom, as a woman, as well as with your children, should they have anxiety. The show was so great that I'm sharing it with you. Jamie sent me the files and I get to share the interview with you. So the tables are turned in this one. Jamie will be asking me all the questions, but you will be able to garner a ton of information on navigating anxiety and hopefully helping yourself and or your family navigate anxiety for a more peaceful, joyful home. I hope you enjoy it. And if you do, please share it and also go follow Jamie. She's on Instagram and she is also at the Keep Them Healthy podcast. Until next time. This is the Keep Them Healthy with Jamie podcast. Season two is here with a focus on women's health. Don't forget to share and rate this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Let's get to it. and welcome to the Keep Them Healthy podcast. This is your host, Jamie. Today on my show, I am happy to welcome Dr. Robin Graham. She is a Christian business coach and an author. And specifically today, we are going to talk about her book, You, Me, and Anxiety. And I'm so excited about this topic in general because I personally have my own struggles with anxiety. It's part of my life for sure. But we're going to talk about her journey uh, we're going to talk about how anxiety manifests into physical symptoms. We're going to talk about the five C's and so much more. So Robin, welcome to the show. Hey, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a delight to get to see your smiling face. I appreciate you so much, Robin. Okay. So Robin, to get started, um, I would love to hear your relationship with anxiety and just your journey of how you got from your childhood to this book and why it's so important for you to write and teach about anxiety. Mm. So Jamie, I have had anxiety since I was a little girl. If you can envision, or if the listeners can envision a little girl sitting on the front steps of her parents' home, doubled over with a stomach ache and crying. Carpool mm. is sitting in the driveway. My mom is trying to push me, get me off that step and into the car for carpool, and I cannot move. That was how I spent my elementary school years. I did not want to go to school. I was afraid. I just struggled immensely. And there was nothing physically wrong with me, even though my stomach hurt, sometimes my head hurt. And these were real physical feels that I had. But there was no rhyme or reason. They couldn't find anything wrong with me. Well, this was anxiety. But no one talked about anxiety back then. No one knew that that's what was manifesting in my body. And so fast forward, I, I survived because I was a bright kid and my parents always nurtured us and helped us along the way if we needed help. And I was able to do very well in school, went to college, got a doctorate degree. But it wasn't until my college, well, partly in high school, I had an indie my eating disorder started and then it really got bad in college. And that's how my anxiety really um, took hold of me as an individual was being able to control what I was consuming uh, because I couldn't control anything else. My brain was always, what if, what if, what if, what if, but I could control that. And that's how my body and my brain worked together to get me through those years. As I got older, I was able to navigate the anxiety much more concretely. And I did that through cognitive behavioral therapy that I learned about on my own. I did have a therapist when my oldest was around 12 years of age, and we started seeing significant signs of anxiety in him. And I thought, this can't happen, not on my watch. He cannot go through life the way I've gone through life. And so at that point in time, we kind of took a step back, um, decreased some of the stress in our home. We were both traveling for work. And I took a step back so that I could be more 
just present with my kids so that we could stop this cycle. And at that point we got therapy and I, I did my own therapy at that point in time too, so that I could better help him. And that was the first time really that I had the help that I needed. And when I could really recognize what was going on all of those years in my body, in my mind, yeah, I knew it was anxiety, but I didn't have the tools to navigate it. Not to mention now people go to therapy and it's it's almost like everybody wants to go to therapy or everybody sees the benefit in therapy. Back then it was more, when I was younger, it was more of a stigma. If you had anything wrong with your brain, you were weird. You were not normal in, in air quotes. And so, you know, there were a lot of stereotypes and stigmas that I chose to avoid and I didn't get the help that I needed when I was younger and really <laughs> could have changed the course or trajectory of my life. But I am a firm believer that, you know, God can handle anything Maybe I can't handle it, but he can handle it and he has a plan. And so his plan was for me to experience all those things so that today I could write the book and I can now help other people because I understand it better. I understand myself better. I understand the entire scope of navigating anxiety in a way that allows people to live a purposeful, joyful, peaceful life. Wow. My heart connects with so many of the things that you just said, a couple of things just personally in my own history with anxiety and, um, and in high school, the controlling with the eating and just navigating it and people not understanding me when, um, after I had a death in the family and it kind of rocked my whole understanding of life and it manifested in anxiety and manifested in OCD, um, and just different things like that. But when I was going through it, a lot of people did not understand and they were just like, just knock it off. Like, don't worry about washing your hands. Just don't wash your hands or don't do this. And, and I was like, that's not what's happening with me. I need to, and I needed to do my, I did my own self-help and my own research. And I do agree that the life experiences that God has given us is to be used as tools. We are meant to learn and teach. And I love what you're doing and teaching. So to continue with the teaching, you had mentioned a couple physical symptoms of anxiety with just stomach aches or headaches. For me, my physical symptoms, I get a burning across my shoulders that go up to my neck. So talk about thinking something was wrong with me because I was like, I don't, I don't understand why, like there must be something in my shoulders. There must be something in my neck that is causing this, right? So you go running to all the doctors and it, now I know it is a symptom. When I start feeling the tingles, I have to reevaluate just the same way you reevaluated when you noticed your son. And I appreciate your cycle breaking with trying to help your son being like, no, I'm breaking this cycle. He's not going through this either. So for me, um, with, and, and as you have done, gone through this journey, what other physical symptoms could we tell my listeners could be associated with uh, anxiety? Yeah, Jamie, that's such a great question. And I think it's so important because we have to recognize the symptoms and then recognize the triggers so that then we can take action to change the cycle within ourselves. So if, and, and whether it's an adult or it's a teen or child, the symptoms can be the same, but it could be that, you know, the heart is racing. It could be, um, like you said, that, that tingling. Like I know for me, when I get that shot of negative adrenaline, where it's just like, it's like pins and needles in my body. It could be this pain in my stomach that it, it almost feels like, um, an ulcer, like heartburn, but it's like worse. It's, I can't even, I can't describe physically the pain that's there, but it's, I know that that specific pain is different than anything else I've ever experienced. And I know that I only get that when I'm anxious about something. And that could be, you know, related to a presentation. It could be related to travel. It could be related to a family event or someone coming to visit, who knows, but that it's very specific. So when you have an, a symptom and it, like I said, you know, racing heartbeat, um, the stomach pain, maybe it's headaches, maybe it's that tension in the shoulders. Maybe it is those pins and needles type feeling where your nerves are just all a lit, or maybe it is, um, inability to sleep. 
tossing and turning, not able to fall asleep. Maybe it's wanting to sleep more than normal and inability to focus. Um, it could be um, OCD symptoms where, mm -hmm. you know, you, you find yourself doing something over and over again repetitively to, and you're like, why am I doing this? Well, what's going on in your life that could be triggering this? So it's identifying those symptoms and then identifying what's triggering it. And you have to have the two so that you can then take action to, okay, now I know that I'm experiencing this symptom over and over again. And for teens, it could even be, or adults, it could be that there's an inability to interact socially, a, a mm -hmm. desire to avoid social situations, to stay home, not want to go to school, not want to go to work. It could be that for a teen, grades are falling. It could be that work is slacking. Um, mistakes are being made because your mind is constantly thinking, what if, what if, or going into a fear cycle. So identifying the two, the symptoms and then the trigger so that you can then navigate that trigger and develop coping mechanisms for whatever that situation is so you can hopefully alleviate the symptoms, but also reframe your brain into approaching those situations or things in a better way so that the anxiety isn't preventing you from being able to do what you need or want to do. Right. So the coping mechanisms that you mentioned, what from the book, is that your, the five C's that you mentioned and write about is that, or is that a, a one a coping mechanism is one of the C's? Yeah, no, that's coping mechanism is not one of the C's. And really it's, okay. it's more, even more so than a, than a coping mechanism. It's adopting a strategy. So the okay. first thing we have to do is well, if we talk about the five C's, we have to, we have to catch these anxious, negative thoughts. And okay. in order to do that, we have to know what the triggers are, what the symptoms are, and then realize what's happening in our body and our brain, because our body and brains are so interwoven that there's this direct line that is, you know, our brain's communicating to our body and our body is reacting viscerally to those negative thoughts or the fear or the anxiety, the depression, whatever, whatever it is. So we have to catch those thoughts. And then once we catch those thoughts, we can ask ourselves, is this realistic? Would someone that I know and love and respect be thinking the same thing about me or the situation that I'm thinking? If Could this be proven in a court of law? And you know, ask yourself these questions. If the answer is no, then it's time to change those thoughts. So you catch, challenge, change those thoughts. The more you get into this practice, the more control you're going to have over your thoughts to be able to, instead of going straight to negativity bias, be able to look at a situation or circumstance, event, whatever, in a more positive way, the more often you experience that ability to control your thoughts, the more confidence you're going to have making decisions and doing the things that you need or want to do. But it really becomes creating that strategy. So if you know that you have a trigger. And let's just use the example of going to a networking event or a social event. And you know that you're now experiencing that symptom that you frequently experience when your anxiety arises. And you know that it's this trigger, that this is it. It's this event that's coming up that is causing you to feel this way because everything else in your life is pretty stable. There's nothing else that's out of sorts. So you know it's this, you can pinpoint it because once you saw this on your schedule, that's when you started having this visceral physical reaction. So now we know that's what it is. So how can we reframe our thinking around this? So if you're anxious about what to wear, well, you can go to Pinterest and you can discover what people are wearing for an event like this. Um, you know, you can Google that. And then you can go to your closet and find something that you feel good in, you feel comfortable in, because the, the better you feel, the more confident you're going to be and the more relaxed you're going to be. OK, so now we have that out of the way. Maybe the next thing is you're curious about who's going to be there and you're worried if you'll have anybody to talk to. You're worried that maybe people will look at you funny because you don't really belong in that social setting or whatever the situation is, whatever it is your brain is telling you. 
can you have a friend accompany you so that you have a wingman, so to speak, to give you that support, be your rock for that event? Or can you reach out to the host and say, hey, do you have a list of who's coming? Is there anybody that you know that I know? Or would you be willing to introduce me to someone so that I feel a little more comfortable? But it's really about creating a strategy so that you can then put yourself in a situation without the anxiety holding you back and keeping that just grip on you so that you feel so miserable and you're able to step into what it is you want or need to do. Does that make sense? It makes a hundred percent sense. I think that my, the way that I'm interpreting this in my brain, the way logically is, and the way that I kind of handle myself is I have to create a create space from my, my thoughts of my anxious thoughts and knowing that I am not those thoughts. I am a consciousness looking at those thoughts and I do have agency in that. And so it's like, mm-hmm. okay, so I'm, I caught them. I see them. I have figured out the situation. And then I say to myself, you know, what am I capable of doing? And that is what you were just explaining. I can get my outfit ready. I can, you know, what is in my power and these, and the more you practice doing this, cause I've caught it myself, the more you practice seeing these thoughts for what they are, their anxiety, anxious thoughts, you kind of create more and more space so that when you see them, you're like, Oh, I know you, you're not me. I'm going to go forward and doing things that serve me. And, and so I do appreciate your coping mechanisms in that regard. And then also just having grace with like, oh, this is a whole new event for me and having grace Mm -hmm. that I can do hard things. I can embrace new things and I am going to have feelings about it because I've never done it before. And that is okay. And I think there's something to be said about that too. Um, Cause I, you, you would hate for people to use anxiety as the reason why they don't do things. And that's what breaks my heart when you see people cutting things out of their life because of Mm -hmm. their emotions and what they're feeling and those fear. Um, Mm -hmm. And that happens all too often, actually. And it's, it's like using anxiety as an excuse or a, or a crutch. And you can also see it where they're using anxiety as an excuse for behaviors because oftentimes, Mm. and this is a symptom that I didn't mention before, but people will become more irritable. And, you know, Mm. people may, parents may say, oh, it's typical teen, but no, that's not necessarily the case. If these are abnormal behaviors for your child, maybe it is because they're a teen, but there is a limit to that. And you have to be able to recognize this is extreme irritability. This is becoming anger. This is becoming uh, almost to the point of, of abusive or hurting other people as a way of coping with their own feelings, their own emotions. And if they're miserable inside their brain, inside their mind, inside their soul, they're going to lash out. They're going to take this out on other people. And typically there is someone that they're close to that they kind of use as a punching bag. So it really is about not using anxiety as an excuse. And I like how you said that space, but it's recognizing that it doesn't define you as a person at all. It's something that you're experiencing, just like you could be experiencing diabetes or heart disease or, you know, a broken bone. It's, it's something that is part of you, but it doesn't define you. And it does not right. negate you from being able to experience life the way other people experience life who don't have anxiety. But the worst thing you can do is use it as an excuse for bad choices, bad behaviors, or not being able to hold relationships and actually owning the fact that it's present and then taking action to navigate it. So can I ask you what action as a parent or a partner or a friend, if you notice that someone you love is becoming irritable and you can, and you who has already had experience with anxiety and like, Oh, I feel like they're uncomfortable in their body because they're uncomfortable with the situation. They're uncomfortable with whatever's going on in their life. And yet they're taking it out on me. What would be your advice to that support friend partner in navigating that situation with your loved one? You know, for me, it's you you don't want to point a finger. So you don't want to say, oh, you're Mm -hmm. anxious. But it's Mm -hmm. it's asking the question, hey, is every is everything okay? Is there anything I can do for you? How how can I help you today? Or even just saying, How are you feeling? Is there anything you want to talk about? 
but recognizing something's out of sort, but not doing it in a way that is accusatory because okay. that's only going to make them more irritable or more upset, right? Because then their brain's going to take that as, oh, they don't like me. They see there's something wrong with me or now they're upset with me. So it's, it's, it's about, I think, having empathy more than anything. And this is one okay. of the reasons I wrote the book was because <clears throat> we see it so often with teens where if someone is different, they're oftentimes pushed away or isolated. And mm -hmm. what happens then? Then those people who are struggling are so desperate for a friendship that they oftentimes will go towards a group that maybe isn't a good fit for them. And they start making decisions that are not healthy or could harm them or someone else. And so it's really important to understand that just because someone has anxiety does not mean they're weird or they don't belong or they don't have a place as a friend or, you know, a, a student in your group or whatever. And so that's one of the reasons I wrote the book was so that if we can start to recognize that someone's going through something and being able to, to put ourselves in their situation, like, okay, something's not quite right. How can I just be kind and open to receive them and accept them as they are, and then let them be who they are so that they don't feel so isolated because that isolation and loneliness is one of the drivers to suicide. And with pe when people have anxiety, it oftentimes is a risk factor for depression, but also the next steps are addiction and then mm -hmm. potential overdose or suicide. And so we have to be mindful that just because someone has this doesn't mean they're a complete misfit and they don't belong. Let's open our hearts and our minds to respect the fact that we're all different and we're all going to experience challenges in our lives, whether they're mental health or physical health, and be able to just have empathy and, and be kind to, and compassionate to say, hey, what's going on today? Can, is there anything I can do for you? Do you want to want to go get a coffee after school? You want to you know, you know, it's maybe it's your friend and they're struggling be, as a new parent or as a parent of teens and just being there to say, hey, want to have a conversation? How can I help you? I'm here to support you. Is there anything that you need? Right. And with the having a relationship with with that and, and creating space to hold someone else's um feelings that may be uncomfortable even for you as a supporter is a it's a tough skill to build but it is something that solidifies that relationship and can continue to build but also it provides that opportunity when you're having that bad day for your friend to reciprocate and and create that safe space for you so i think that was a really beautiful message and i also um would love to continue to talk about from here so now that we have we caught the negative thoughts, we challenge them, we change them. So is that the three of the C's? What are the next two? So control and confidence. So the more we do that practice of catching, challenging, changing, okay. the more control we'll have over our thoughts. And then the more confidence we'll build within ourselves to be able to make decisions and do the things that have in the past been so frightening and that we've not been able to do because of the anxiety. And when we think of anxiety, and I think this is important thing to note, Jamie, is that when we have anxiety, it's and the cover of my book has a Ferris wheel on it. And the reason it has a Ferris wheel is because when we have anxiety, it's like this cycle of what if negative thoughts. And, you know, if you think of a Ferris wheel at the carnival, it's supposed to be this fun, exciting thing. So you get in line and then the Ferris wheel slows down. It lets you on and it goes slow for a little bit. Well, it lets other people off and other people on. But with anxiety, those negative what if thoughts just keep coming in and they keep coming in faster and faster and faster and faster. And it, they're not slowing down. The brain is continuously in this quick cycle of negative what if thoughts instead of slowing down and letting positive thoughts in. So we have to break that cycle. And to yes. do that is recognizing what's happening and then catching those thoughts, challenging them so that our mind can see that it's okay. It's okay. This 
I can stop these. And that's the most beautiful thing about how God created the brain is that those neural pathways can be changed. So we can be in that cycle of negative thoughts, but we can actually, if we take action consistently, this isn't something that's one or done. You don't do this for a day and you're done. This is like a lifetime of of intentional action to keep your brain focused on the positive. Because let's face it, we, we live in a world where there's we're thrown so many stimulus and we're we're constantly having to navigate things that we see and hear or other people do or say. And we need to be able to be able to catch those those thoughts to say, okay, is this realistic for me? Did, and a lot of times it can be hard to navigate relationships because we're sensitive people and we think automatically, oh, that they mean that negative versus most likely they didn't mean that negative. It's just they said something their way because of what they're experiencing and it had nothing to do with us. It had everything to do with them. And so it's right. really being able to catch what we're thinking about people things, situations, experiences, instead of automatically letting our brain go to that negative place. Innately, genetically, we are wired to negativity bias. And that means our brain is two thirds more likely to hold on to something negative than to accept the positive. So if I told you today, oh, your hair looks fabulous, but yesterday someone told you you needed a haircut, what are you going to focus on? Right. The negative that you need a haircut right. and you're going to just completely ignore my comment that was a compliment, something positive. And that's just how the brain works. And then you throw in epigenetics. So whatever happened to our grandparents when we were pregnant mm-hmm. or when they were pregnant with our parents, that trickles down into our emotional state and how our neural pathways are working. So it's it's not that there's something wrong with you. It's that there's a hiccup in those neural pathways and now we need to change them. I love the Well, I love neuroscience in general, but when you're talking about changing your pathways, I've, I've seen it in my own life um, about the negative negativity bias is it's actually meant to keep us safe, right? And to keep us living longer to notice Absolutely. when there are negative things. However, we live back in to a- cavemen. Oh yes. And, and we don't have, I don't know. <laughs> we don't have- different bears and tiger tasting. Anyway, it's just not, that's not what we have the dings of, of the next text message or the next notification or the next that. So we have constant firings and, and you're, you're always on aware awareness. But what I've learned is that when I notice my negative thoughts, you know, I always say like, yes, I can choose to follow that, or I can choose to follow love, which essentially we are, that is what we are made for. And so I Mm -hmm. always try to hedge over to the, to the, how can I love this person who said that to me? Or how can I love myself when I have this negative thought or whatever it is in that way? And then let me tell you something, you can talk rewiring and your brain shifting the brain that I had 20 years ago versus the brain now in regards to its cycle of thoughts is totally different. And it's only because I, you have to just start, you just have to start saying, no, your hair looks great today. I love your hair. You love it long. You know, I don't know, like when it, when it comes to that hair situation and then just continue on and continue on and push through. And all of a sudden it's not so hard. And all of a sudden every day, little bit, little bit. And then when the hard things do come in, like you do have a death in the family or you have a child with anxiety. I always say to, to my friends and family, I'm like, this is what we train for these coping mechanisms, these, these life experiences, this is what we've been training for. And so let's use it. Don't let's not panic. Let's just, how do we cope with anxiety? How can I teach this person or how can I get through this situation with the tools that I have created and used, you know, and, and I've seen it in real time and it is, it's so empowering when you're like, okay, I feel that tingling for me. It's that physical symptom of tingling. And I'm like, I, I, I notice what's going on. I make sure I make more time and space for, um, relaxation and breathing and stretching and just navigating it the way that my body knows how. And you can have a whole different relationship with anxiety. And I think that's the beauty of your book and the message that you're trying to also really like send out to everybody is that everyone's Mm going to have this Ferris wheel in their lives. 
you just have to decide whether you're going to stay on it or if you're going to get off it and that you have agency to do that. And it's easier Mm -hmm. every time. Like if you keep Mm -hmm. going that way, I just appreciate that so much. Yeah. And, and like you said, Jamie, there are ways too, that we can reduce that anxiety. So yes, it's important to recognize and take action and all of that, but there are also ways we can reduce it. And that's, you know, eating healthy, exercising, avoiding social media. If it is causing an escalation of your anxiety. And, you know, that's yeah. especially for, I think, teens where comparison comes into play. Comparison Ooh, is yes. always going to elevate anxiety. So if mm-hmm. there are situations that you can avoid, then avoid them because we don't have to subject ourselves to these things that are causing us to have more anxiety just because other people are comfortable there. And the other thing that I've found that really helps too is a gratitude practice where you know, and journaling. So if you're experiencing these negative thoughts, then write these negative things down and right next to them, write the positive alternative because it helps the brain connect. Oh, I don't have to think that way. I can think this way. And just Mm. taking, using those neural pathways from your brain to your hand to get that out of your head and onto paper, it's like meditating. There's a lot of power there to be able to transition, transform those thoughts. And then when you have a gratitude practice, you start to see how much good there is compared to what your brain is telling you is bad. And so that's part of that journaling practice is where, you know, you can get all of those negative thoughts out and then document the positive things and express gratitude for the, for the good so that you can start seeing more good, less bad. Absolutely. And it works. Hands down. Oh, it works. The more absolutely. you start practicing it, it's it's phenomenal. It really, truly works. I mean, it's it's hard to explain. You have to experience it. But when you have hit a low with the the way you feel in the world and the way that you feel like you're experiencing the world, and then you start to make these changes, and all of a sudden, there's just one day where you literally forget that you felt so low before. And you're mm-hmm. like, I can't believe mm-hmm. that I'm at this point where when I get the phone call from a friend who was going through a tough time that I can be empathetic and I can also share insight and I can give help. And so for this in general, just in regards to this conversation about anxiety, I would love for everyone to read Robin's book, You May Not Anxiety, and also to share and to talk about it with your family, your friends. Even if you're not a teen, there are women who compare themselves to other moms, They co- or you compare yourself to your own workers or all these things. And, and guess what? That coworker and that mom is doing the exact same thing. That's just our human nature. So I love just talking about it and getting it out there and showing people your humanity and saying, I have anxiety too. And but, you know, this really helps me. And it, I noticed that you're not going through a good time right now. How can I help you? And, and um, just feeling like we're all in the same wavelength versus being like, they're different. They're going through a tough time. I'm not going to deal with that type vibe. So I just appreciate mm-hmm. your whole message, Robin. And if you were to go back now, this is um, kind of switching gears here. Is there anything that you would add to the book now after publishing it and having it out and having more and more conversations with people after creating the book? Is there any addendums or anything you would add in now um, looking back? I suppose if I were to add anything, it would be more stories from other people. Um, You know, this was more memoir. Um, okay. but being able to share more stories may have been a little bit more insightful. I told it from my perspective and my journey. Okay. So maybe adding other stories, I feel like, you know, there's, there's always, you always look back and you think of ways you can improve something. And so, yeah, I might have added maybe more individual stories from other people, but I think you know, just more emphasis on navigating and and changing those neural pathways. I mean, that's what the whole book is about, but I I feel like it's pretty inclusive in terms of all of the topics and things we addressed. Um, If listeners, I I think the parent book is probably the best for for listeners of your show because they're adults. Um, Absolutely. And it, it is the same as the teen book, but then I add the parent chapters at the end. 
I -hmm. think there are a few things that in the parent book, you know, I emphasized a lot more on parenting, like what my parents did wrong, what I did wrong. Um, Okay. And then maybe how to, to change that. And I think one of the keys, Jamie, is that when people say, get over it, like you mentioned, just Mm -hmm. people were saying to you, just stop it, just stop doing that, or just, you know, get over it. That's not possible. And anxiety is teamwork. So you need support and you need support, whether that support is through loved ones, through a, a teacher or a counselor, a psychiatrist, maybe it's therapy, maybe it's medication. It's we're not meant to navigate this journey alone. The mind is very complex. And I do emphasize that in the book, but perhaps I could have emphasized that more. I don't know, Jamie. I mean, what yeah. do you, did you, when you listened to the book, did you right. see something that was missed? I'm, I'm curious. No, I just think that when, after any time I create something and then I start talking about to other people and other people like mention something and I would be like, oh, you know what? I could have totally went off on that type specific topic with it. But no, I actually, I thought you did an, an, an awesome job. I just, for anxiety in general, it can be so, it can show up in so many different avenues. So I like what you're saying. Like it's your personal journey because my personal journey was very similar, but had obviously different small changes. Um, and yeah. parenting wise, I think generationally, I think your parents, the way that they grew up, they were going to parent your anxiety different than the way my parents are going to parent anxiety, the way that I'm going to parent anxiety, because yeah. it is not a stigma anymore in regards to talking about these things. It's more or less if you want to deal with it as parents, there's a lot to deal with. There's a lot. This is a busy life. A lot of parents have to, this is air quotes, like deal with their kids. It's like anxiety. And this can be very frustrating because it's not a quick, like turn it off situation. This is a day to day practice support system and going through all that. So I, I feel like that could be something. You just made a really good point. Okay. You just made a really good point that it's not a stigma anymore. Mm-hmm. I would disagree to some extent oh, because I think okay. there are st- I think there are still a lot of stereotypes and I think okay. that because anxiety is still not understood to the level that it needs to be understood, it's not okay. as accepted as a medical illness. It's ex- it's thought of as something's wrong with the brain. And if okay. that thought is still there, Kids are still being isolated and people are still feeling uncomfortable. And you can go to any networking event and you're going to see people who are kind of on the outskirts or they don't really make eye contact when they're talking. There's a lot of things. And and maybe this is something that I could have added into the book is that, you know, recognizing it more in other people and how Mm -hmm. you can see some of those behaviors but there are still a lot of people who are very uncomfortable in their own skin because they have mental health challenges. And until people recognize it and are willing to be uncomfortable with that person to have conversations, there's still a stigma. But the other thing that is related to that is that, yes, people are talking a lot more about anxiety and mental health challenges now because you see the the college athletes, you see the pro athletes coming out, but the, the prevalence of suicide is still going up. Mm -hmm. So there's still a problem. And part of that problem is that enough people aren't getting the help and the treatment that they need. And the other part of that problem that I see is that more and more people are using anxiety as an excuse for bad choices, bad behaviors even though they don't have clinical anxiety, they have not been diagnosed with anxiety, but Mm. because more and more people are talking about it, they're using it as an excuse. And so that I do mention this in the book that people have clinical anxiety. So if you are stressed out, maybe worried about an exam or worried about a project at work, and you're like, Oh, I'm so anxious about this. You're but you don't have a clinical diagnosis of anxiety and everybody can be anxious. But if you're with someone who truly has anxiety, 
it's very hurtful to them because you're downplaying the significance of what they're going through on a daily basis. So that's just another area to be mindful of. And I probably, I guess back to your question, I could have emphasized that a little bit more because if there is something that I see too often now, it's that people are using it as an excuse, as an, as a crutch, or just as kind of a catch all for emotions. And that doesn't help those people who are truly in that clinical state of disarray from an, um, a mind, from a mindset or an emotional state. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And I, as you're mentioning all these things, I feel humbled in the fact that just because my relationship has changed with it and the way that I'm navigating it as I watch my children or friends and all that, I am but one small person in the world, you know, that maybe I don't really truly because I haven't dove in the way that you've dove in being, you know, writing this book and being involved in this world with it. I don't really truly realize the impact that is still worldwide versus my small little arena that I surround myself with. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. It's good to be reminded. Um, But I I think that the excuse situation, I can understand that because when I was an over completely overwhelmed, like it's all encompassing anxiety when it hits at certain points. I would be a little bit frustrated too with someone who's like, you're taking a test, you're going to take it and you're going to move on and then go like have the rest of your lovely day. But when you are in anxiety and your clinical anxiety, that it's not just popping in and out of it, like a test, no. to get out. And that it's, it's, you're in it long all day, every day. And so thank you for bringing that up too. Um, and mm-hmm. anxiety is not an excuse for anything. It's a, it's, it can be a challenge, but it's not something that you say, I have this. So therefore I can burn down the city with it because I'm so uncomfortable and frustrated and angry and irritable and all these things. That's not okay. So I don't agree with that either, that it can be used as an excuse. But I think you're right to say that a lot of people are just looking for reasons for why they can do what they do and feel validated as it being a mental Mm -hmm. issue or being um, an excuse. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And you just said something that I really want to emphasize too, Jamie, because when you have anxiety, and I kind of mentioned this when I was talking about the example of the, the Ferris wheel or the analogy mm-hmm. of the Ferris wheel, when, when you have anxiety, maybe you have to do a presentation. And you, for someone who does not have clinical anxiety, they can feel some anxious, some, they can feel a little bit anxious. Um, they can feel worried. They can feel nervous about going into that presentation. Mm-hmm. Once they right. give that presentation, they're done. And yeah. they just have, you can almost see like the stress is yep. all just rolling off of them. But for somebody with anxiety, it's, oh no, I didn't say this part. Or what if they didn't mm. like it? What if they're talking about me? Oh my gosh, they looked at me funny. They didn't like what I said. And you, for days after you can be evaluating what mm. if thoughts about that experience. And it's, I wish I could express like the feeling and how heavy that makes a person mm-hmm. feel with anxiety, yep. but it's even if you are navigating it and taking the action and, and being treated for it or whatever, that your brain just naturally for all of those years has been in that path that, you know, those pathways have been functioning this way and it's really hard to break. So it takes, you know, intentional action, even after you have successfully delivered that presentation to say, okay, what if thoughts, it's time to go away. We did it. We're done. Let's go. We're going to go forward and we're just going to make an assumption within ourselves that it was all good until someone tells us it wasn't, but it's really hard to do. That again, it's a muscle that needs to be exercised and strengthened through experience, through the day to day. And then at the end, if you're like someone that the child that had that experience at the end of the day, you can talk about it to your supporter, whoever, your parent, your friend and say, and then they'll say to you, yep, you're right. Nobody has said anything about it you did it. It's done. Moving on. That's awesome. Like, what do we want to talk about now? You know? So yeah. I appreciate yeah. all the advice today, Robin, you did an amazing job. Thank you so much for your book and for your passion towards educating and helping people who suffer from anxiety and to give them a, just the light at the end of the tunnel to be like, Hey, this is something that you can do. You can work through and learn and build tools and live in it with a different relationship with anxiety. So Robin, where can we find you? 
these days? What um, the best? Social? Yeah. Okay. The best whatever. place to find me. Yeah. My website is the best place to find me or the podcast, okay. the Robin Graham show. Um, okay. If you are a a mom there and you want more resources on anxiety, I, you can go to the website and you can go to okay. the Robin Graham.com or you, me and anxiety.com either one. And I'm the Robin Graham everywhere on social media. So you can also find me there as well. Awesome. And I really do advise check out everything that Robin has. Um, she has an amazing business coaching uh, strategy um, that deals with using social media to minimal, like growing your business without it, which is amazing. And, um, and then also check out her book, You May Anxiety. And Robin, I just appreciate you today. Thank you so much for being on the show. And listeners, as I always say, you do you, stay well, and keep them healthy. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, Jamie.